Hello and welcome to this podcast brought to you by Argus Media, a leading independent provider of energy and commodity pricing information. My name is Caroline Messica and I am the senior reporter for Rare Earths and Electronic Metals. Previously on Metal Movers, we took a look at a new semiconductor material called silicon carbide, really taking it from the perspective of the automotive industry. And now we're going to dig a bit deeper into the material itself. And to help me with this, I have two experts, Sir Simon Price, Chief Executive of Consultancy Exawatt and Senior Research Analyst Adam Dawson. So, silicon carbide, what is it, how does it work and why does it matter? Starting with why does it matter? Well, it comes down to getting more out of the grid uh, and more generally putting more of the energy we generate to useful work. So we need to decarbonize the world. And to do that, we need to electrify as many of our industrial and transportation systems as possible Mm -hmm. because electricity networks can be decarbonized by converting them to renewable energy. And we can use silicon carbide to build more efficient power conversion systems, which means more of the power we generate at the grid or that we store in a car battery, for example, in in an electric vehicle battery. More of that energy gets to its destination rather than being lost in transmission. So it's sort of like um, a leaky pipe losing losing water on the from the mains. It's the same kind of concept. You're 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 saving energy by losing less of it. Uh, yeah, fundamentally, yes. Uh, an inefficient system would have losses in the system, mostly in the form of heat. So a highly efficient power conversion system uh, essentially doesn't get as hot. So more of that electrical power gets to where you want to use it. So from the battery to the to the wheels or to the motor, for example. Brilliant. And, and let's take a look at how, how it works. Uh, Adam, can you can you help us with this? Uh, yeah, so, so silicon carbide is a, a semiconductor material, it's a semiconducting uh, yeah, material, and it's used to make um, electronic devices that work in exactly the same way as, as silicon semiconductors to control and convert power. Um, and although, it's, although it works in exactly the same way, silicon carbide is, is much more efficient and it can also allow you to build smaller and lighter systems. It requires less cooling because uh, of that efficiency, like Simon mentioned. Um, it can also handle much higher voltages than silicon. Um, so when you combine all that together, that, that overall creates a much, uh, yeah, much more efficient system. And for example, if you're using it in a electric vehicle, mm-hmm. uh, it's using the inverter to, uh, between the battery and the motor, or it's used in the charging systems. Overall, taking all these benefits together, it results in a it can result in a five to ten percent increase in range over silicon in a like for like replacement. Um, that that sounds like a lot. Like a ten percent range increase sounds like a, a big difference from from the perspective of the manufacturer. Yeah, exactly. And and you instead of you can also think of it in terms of instead of just increasing the range of the vehicle, you could keep the range of the vehicle the same and reduce the size of the battery by a corresponding amount up to about ten percent. Once you start thinking of it like that, although the material, although silicon carbide technology is far more expensive than than silicon, once you start considering the the costs at a system level, for example, the, the battery size, all of a sudden it become becomes worth it as a technology in both a cost and an efficiency sense. Brilliant. And who have been the early adopters? Well, uh, in automotive, and I think automotive is probably the, the sort of the largest single market and the driver of kind of the mainstream of silicon carbide. And so within automotive, Tesla was the early adopter in about uh, 2017, 18, uh, when it decided to use silicon carbide in the inverter of its Model 3. And then since then, it's rolled out silicon carbide across all of its models. Uh, so Tesla really takes a kind of system thinking approach uh, and, you know, as Adam said, it's not just about the uh, the cost of the silicon carbide uh, at the inverter level. It's about the saving you can get on the battery. So if you can make your, your car go 10% further for the same energy, effectively, you can uh, fix the range and reduce the size of that pack. So you're making that pack smaller and you're making big savings there. So Tesla saw that and, and has rolled out silicon carbide across the board now. Other automotive manufacturers have been following suit more recently, and we expect that within a few years, every significant uh, automotive maker will be using silicon carbide. In terms of the key players, um, ST Micro is the company that supplies the silicon carbide transistors to Tesla, and Wolfspeed is the pioneer uh, at the upstream end 
the pioneer of crystal growth and uh, wafer manufacturing. So this is the company that supplies a good portion of the industry today. And, and what are the barriers? What's the biggest barrier to, to adoption that you that you can identify? Um, it's really the, the the cost of the silicon carbide and the availability of it. So silicon carbide is incredibly expensive to grow. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it grows at very high temperature uh, and very slowly, uh, certainly in comparison with silicon, the silicon that it's replacing. And so that means that the the cost of the device is extremely high, but also the ability to scale that manufacturing process is much more limited. So as demand grows, uh, we expect the, the the manufacturing costs to come down over time as supply grows. But at the moment, the real bottleneck is in the crystal growth. So it's right at the top of the supply chain. Is it possible that they'll get much better at it, that there will be a sort of um, a big change in, in the ability to mass produce the the crystal or produce it on a battery you can't mass produce it but produce it on a larger scale more easily yeah uh, yes in in broad terms yes it's not possible to dramatically increase the growth rate although there are there are have been some steps to increase it quite significantly i think the biggest way to expand the scale is to to go parallel really so it's just more growth furnaces so it's more manufacturers doing more and more uh, crystal growth in silicon carbide crystal growth in parallel and are there some other applications that it could be used in um, outside the, the EVs? Yeah, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, in, in principle, grid transmission is a huge application. I mean, fundamentally, silicon carbide has uh, potential anywhere you're looking at transferring reasonably large amounts of power at reasonably large voltages. So when we talk about large voltages, we're talking sort of 600 volts and above, generally speaking, something mm-hmm. like that. And in in power terms, we're talking anywhere from sort of electric vehicles upwards. So a grid transmission network or grid transformer or an HVDC interconnect would be, in principle, a great application for silicon carbide. Although uh, applications, as as you go to the higher end of the power and voltage scale, are still some way out. They're still, to some extent, in the R and D phase at the moment. But we can absolutely see. Uh, a market there. And uh, another big application today, it's been around mm-hmm. for a while, is uh, uh, PV inverters. So using silicon carbide to make the inverter more efficient. So when you generate your solar energy in the panel, more mm-hmm. of that energy makes it to the grid through the inverter. Excellent. And just in terms of the market itself, how fast do you expect the silicon market, carbide market to grow? Uh, so yeah, well, we've been modelling this um, primarily in the context of electric vehicles, as this is this is definitely where we see the the short to medium term growth coming from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, our market modelling, looking out to 2030, we see a market for for devices and modules, certain carbide devices and modules, approaching five billion by the end of the decade. Um, that's driven by passenger vehicles, of which that's about 3.7 billion of the total, uh, and that's up from around. From yeah, between one and one and a half billion today. So that's that's a big jump, and and that's pretty pretty quickly as well, based on your forecast. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's got a it's got a long way to to grow. Um, just in terms of the forecast itself, what kind of variables go into that? It's always interesting to sort of look under the hood and see and see what made the number. Yeah, so we're we're looking at and analysing um, all sorts of different variables. For example, the the technology developments and how that influences device and material requirements. Uh, we're looking at the manufacturing costs right across the supply chain. We're looking at the growth in the EV markets and how that's going to change. Um, and we're looking at the the specifications in in electric vehicles and the the end applications and how that will influence the market. Um, so all of those variables will lead to you know, can lead to a different market progression and size. And we've set some scenarios based on how those different a- factors interact with each other and lead to different levels of adoption of the technology. Uh, for example, we look very closely at the, the interaction between the kind of manufacturing costs and the cost of devices and systems and how that relates to adoption. Uh, we, we, uh, in our most aggressive cost reduction scenario, that leads to a much higher adoption of the technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you end up with a higher volume market, but with lower value. And then in our, our kind of least aggressive cost reduction scenarios, when that we with lower adoption, um, but it's a higher value market. And actually we find that overall, it leads to a very similar market size uh, when looking across the different scenarios. 
Um, we would also note as well that you know in, in our rapid cost reduction scenarios that also offers more opportunity to open up other markets and other applications as the cost of the technology comes down and the value case increases across different applications and, and different system types. Um, there is an increasing amount of talk about sort of the electrification of flight. Does silicon carbide have a role to play there? Uh, I think, yes, in, in principle, it could have a big role to play. So one thing we, we only referenced uh, briefly was that silicon carbide enables you to make smaller, lighter power conversion systems. And those matter in a car when you're moving uh, some heavy object along a road, but they matter even more in a plane where you're trying to get an object off the ground and keep it in the air and then land it again. So in in flight, in aviation, weight matters more than anything else or power density and energy density matter more than anything else. And so silicon carbide could have a big role to play there in light weighting of power transmission systems. Well, this is all fascinating stuff. And, and I, we look forward to monitoring developments and seeing how these supply chains develop. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to, to Simon and Adam for coming in today and um, helping us understand this, this new technology. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, please tune in to other episodes to learn about the metals market. And for more information, please visit our website at argusmedia.com. Mm-hmm.